Hello everyone, um, welcome back to another lecture here. So now we're going to talk about, I think, one of the most difficult concepts to comprehend mentally and conceptually is um, we're going to start talking about quantum mechanics. Okay, so quantum mechanics is um, it's kind of how we view the, um, the world of the particles that we can't see. So in physics, you're probably familiar with classical mechanics where you um, have um, macroscopic objects that, you know, we kind of have a good understanding of how um, things work, um, how particles, or not particles really, but large objects or objects that we can actually see and perceive with our senses, we kind of have a good understanding of how they work physically um, in the world. So quantum mechanics is all about the particles that we can't see. So in my lectures for this um, topic, I like to start off with Schrodinger's cat. So the theory about Schrodinger's cat, so we could think um, it's kind of like this conundrum um, with what we, uh, what's actually happening and what's not. So um, in quantum mechanics, um, the thing we kind of have to wrap our heads around is that in quantum mechanics, particles, they can, we can say they assume two quantum states. The state that we, you can, we can perceive um, due to like a, an effect, a, a natural phenomenon, for example, light shining, um, that's, that's when particles are excited. And then when particles rest back down, um, they give off light and that's what we perceive. So in, um, in quantum mechanics, we state that the um, particle is, is um, occupying one or two states. And at the end of this lecture, we'll watch a little video about um, these two um, states and how they're, they're kind of interrelated, okay? So you just have to stick with me um, for our discussion of quantum mechanics. And I would say to really understand it, you need to come to the discussion, ask a lot of questions, make sure you um, read the lectures or go over, watch the lectures. And then you may need to use external resources that help for more, you know, for more information to help you um, understand the topic. So that's usually how, um, how quantum mechanics goes. But um, um, if you, just, uh, if you um, work hard and um, you kind of put your best effort in, you um, you can do it. Anyone could understand quantum mechanics, but um, it's it's a very tricky subject, I would say, and it's really it's kind of difficult to um, teach as well. Okay, so Schrodinger's cat. So don't worry, no cats were harmed in this experiment. So this is a dot exercise. So here, here, uh, here's our scenario. We have a cat. We have a flask of poison and a radioactive source are placed in a sealed box, okay? Um, so if our box here, or our monitor detects some sort of radioactivity, um, which is basically an atom decaying, um, a single atom decaying to another atom, or to another element, or to, um, to some other particle. Um, the flask will shatter, because it will trigger the, um, the hammer there to flat, uh, shatter the flask. And that will release the poison, which kills the cat. Okay, so the Copenhagen interpretation of this quantum mechanics is that um, after a while, um, the cat is simultaneously alive and dead. So that's called superposition of quantum states. So it's saying that, okay, um, at any point in time, we can, uh, uh, you know, in quantum mechanics, a, a particle can only occupy one of two um, allowed states. And, um, and what we observe in experiment is one, of, one or two of those states, you know, is the particle in the ground state or is it in, in a, an elect, uh, excited state? Um, however, you know, but if we kind of consider this at, uh, uh, if we kind of consider um, that reality with this experiment, um, we kind of have a conundrum here. Um, when we look in the box, right, um, the cat will be either alive or dead, right? Not both alive and dead. But um, 
Yeah, so this is kind of where quantum mechanics gets kind of trippy because it kind of asks us this question. Um, where does quantum superposition end? And, you know, when, does, when do we see the reality? When do we perceive the effect that this particle um, has in terms of, you know, energy, has in terms of uh, matter, uh, you know, um, displaying an effect? due to some matter interacting with something else um so um that's kind of the dilemma of quantum mechanics i like to think about um there's these small particles and they um they're not like classical particles right they're not like classical objects objects you know they definitely exist right but um when you have something infinitely small they can do some um they can do some some things that we can't explain with classical physics. So we have to develop a model here that kind of that kind of takes um, um, based on evidence and experiment. We kind of limit you know the possibilities of like say what an electron can do. Like okay, electron. We know electrons they carry charge. They're the reason why uh, uh, we can conduct electricity. And one thing. Um, we kind of have to kind of accept is that these electrons they can um, they can do um, things that are not normally possible for larger objects, right? A larger a large object, say like a crate, right? Um, a crate either is stationary or it moves. It's not like it disappears, right? But um, for electron, you know, we can we know electrons are there. And when we excite an electron, we can get an electrical signal. So we know the electron carries some charge. But when it's not carrying an electrical signal, we, we don't really know if it's there or not. Um, we just assume it's there, but it's, um, you know, not, um, I guess what you say, in its active state where we can perceive it. So, um, so when we have really small particles, you know, it's, they're kind of going in between this active state and inactive state. And the inactive state is what we call the ground state, which is um, the lowest possible state they can be in and kind of like exist in an atom, for example, in the electron. Okay, so that's kind of my introduction to quantum mechanics. We kind of have to um, uh, make some assumptions here and kind of accept some things as reality and um, just um, fact, okay? But um, I'll, it'll all make sense, I, I think, in the end, okay? All right, so let's move on here. Waves, so let's talk about waves. So uh, when we talk quantum mechanics, um, we usually have to talk about the wave part properties of, uh, uh, of matter. So in this case, waves can carry energy through space, much like you know how like a water ripples when you, when you disturb the surface. Um, you um, transfer energy to the water and you're actually, the energy is causing the water to move in a wave-like fashion. So, so a wave is um, how energy is transferred through space um, and it oscillates. And when something oscillates, um, that oscillation is caused by energy passing through the uh, matter. And that's how, and, uh, how, that's how energy um, can be transferred um, through the air, through air waves, you know, um, and not, uh, and not, um, and not only through um, particles, right? So we know particles um, contain energy, right? Electrons, they contain energy, but also um, the way um, energy can be transferred is also through waves. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about waves here. So waves have other properties too. They have speed, so we can have speed. Waves can have speed, right? So waves and the speed have a certain a certain speed move at certain speeds okay okay so um what you know waves in the ocean right they can even move really fast or can they can really move slow so waves can also have speed and that um and we'll kind of relate this back to the speed of light where um 
you know, sound waves move slower uh, than light waves. Is, you know, if you were to turn, um, if you were to turn on a light in the in the say a home or a house, you see that the light spreads quickly throughout the house, much much faster, much 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 faster than sound. So you turn on like a speaker, um, the the time and speed at which it reaches um, throughout the house will be much uh, slower than, than say light, okay? All right, frequency. So frequency of a wave is defined as the number so the number of wave cycles wave cycles per unit time. So you, um, students may have heard of this before when they took physics. So the unit for frequency is um, the hertz. So if you um, ever turn on your radio, that's basically making sound waves at a particular frequency, and that's given in hertz. So like um, turn your radio like 101.3, 92.7. Those are specific radio frequencies that um, communicate electrical signal. Okay. So the hertz we define it as the number of cycles. Per second. So, um, not, uh, hertz is another way of saying inverse seconds. So it's it's the number of something per given time. So usually a sound wave would travel would make um, um, would make a complete um, um, cycle and would make a number of cycles per given time unit. So usually it's per second. So waves move really fast, so they can make, they can uh, occupy several, um, I won't say just several, but many, um, many, many um, cycles per second because light tends to move very fast. Okay. Wavelength has the symbol lambda, Greek symbol lambda, that's for wavelength right here. So it kind of looks like a, um, a kanji character, but it's not a kanji character. Okay, so it's a uh, so it's the Greek letter lambda. All right, so the wavelength is the difference. The difference, or sorry, not the difference. My apologies. The distance. The distance between repeating parts of a wave. Okay. So usually this, um, this is in units of, so units are usually meters or um, nanometers so usually we say um, when we're talking about wavelength of something we usually have nanometers so i'll put in nanometers which is um 10 to the negative ninth meters so very small and it's kind of a wonder why we can um we can't see these things because they're so small and uh and it's impossible for us to perceive okay all right, last thing we want to talk about is amplitude. So what's the amplitude? So the amplitude um, is pretty much the height of the, of the, of the wave. Of the, we'll talk about, uh, we'll go over some of these waves in a minute, but it's pretty much the difference. All right, between the highest. between the highest 
or lowest point on the wave in the middle point and the middle or say in the middle of the wave okay so this is, let's use this as an example okay so say my line is right here Okay. Okay. So that you can make that a little bit more even. Okay. So let's um let's label this a little bit. So the distance between the middle part of the wave and the, the lowest or the highest point of the wave. This is called our amplitude. So this will be our amplitude of the wave. Okay. So the distance between two troughs, so the bottom up here are called troughs. So this will be, um, so this part of the wave, trough. And this, the top part of the wave is called the crest of the wave. Okay, so the distance between two troughs or two crests of the wave, um, that's called the wavelength. So that, the distance between those two point, the two troughs here, are the two apex, or the two um, the the most bottom, the bottommost part of the wave, that's called the wavelength. We call that the wavelength. Okay. So, so we call um, so the frequency of the wave is pretty much you know um, one cycle. So if we trace this line here. So this, if we trace this line, okay, we're going there and then pretty much over here where we started out with on when we hit the line again, that's called one cycle. So one cycle um, equals trough plus crest, okay? So in this case, if we kind of label this here as one, one cycle, here's the second cycle, and here's the third cycle. Okay? So if we assume that this length here, this, this, the y-axis will be time, okay? So we assume that this is going to be a um, one second. So let's assume this whole time interval is one second. So that means I have three cycles per second. So my frequency, uh, so we could denote frequency as nu, um, Greek letter nu, that's not V, nu. So V equals three inverse seconds, okay? And, or we could say it's three hertz. All right. So in this case, um, let's compare these two. All right. Let's compare these two graphs now. So we see here that the low, the graph on below is. Um, we see that the. We see that the. Um, um, there's more, there's more, um, what we call, this is what I call a sine curve. Um, if students remember in math that the sine function, uh, it crosses the axis at like, um, I believe it's, uh, zero. So just, um, so the, this looks like a sine function. Okay. So, um, so this would be a, uh. So you see the the, the kind of look, the sine function right on the top, 
looks a little more um it looks like the wave is moving slower right because we only go through three cycles per this given time unit of one second but if we look at the same time interval for the bottom graph we see that there's more um there's more cycles per second and if we were to um count them it will be one two three four, five, six, seven, eight. So yeah, it's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine cycles. Uh, yeah, so oh, about nine cycles. Okay, so it looks like we have nine cycles. And we see here that the wavelength between to two points here is now much shorter than our previous example. So we can say in this example we have a shorter wavelength and we have a higher frequency. So this frequency is about 9 uh, inverse seconds or 9 hertz. Okay, so it moves much faster. In this case, we would say this will have a long wavelength and a um, small frequency. Small frequency or low frequency, okay? So that's how we um, kind of think about waves. Those are the terms we need to know. And um, what's most important is that for, you, for a longer wavelength, you're going to have a smaller frequency. And then for a shorter wavelength, the frequency of the wave, the frequency of the, uh, of, the wa of the wave is going to be higher. So that's what we should take away from this. Okay. So there's two equations um, that we can consider here, okay? Okay. Okay. So, um, so for any, um, so for any combination of frequency and wavelength, you're going to get the speed of the wave. Let me let me explain. So here's frequency times um, lambda. So frequency times wavelength will always give you speed. Okay. So the units for frequency are inverse seconds, right? And then the units for wavelength are usually a unit of distance or length. And so let's, in this case, let's say meters. So if we do that, we get the units for speed, which is meters per second. That tells us how fast we're going, right? Okay. So we can say frequency times wavelength. will give us our speed, speed of the wave, okay? So that's why we characterize speed, because now they're all coming together. Okay, so um, let's do this um, exercise, and then we'll end the video here, okay? So orchestras in the United States um, tune their instruments to the note A, which has a frequency. So every note, you know, has a particular sound, right? So it's producing a particular sound wave and that, that has a characteristic uh, frequency, speed, and wavelength. So that's why they sound different. And we could perceive um, these waves based on their frequency. Okay, so it has a frequency of 440 cycles per second or 430 hertz. If the speed of sound is 1,116 feet per second, what is the wavelength of this note? So we could keep the unit, we could keep, we don't need to convert any of these units to a specific unit. So we could just solve for, uh, for wavelength given our equation we just went over. Okay, 
So, so frequency times lambda, remember, gives us our speed. So to differentiate frequency and speed, I'm just going to call speed u. Okay? So if you see u, that means it's speed. Okay. So the frequency is 440 hertz. Now remember, hertz has units inverse seconds. So we put inverse seconds here. Times the wavelength, which is, well, we don't know the wavelength, right? So we're going to put that as lambda, and we're going to solve for it. But we know the speed of light. Sorry, speed of sound is 1,116 feet per second. Okay, there we go. Now, if we, now we solve... For lambda equals 116 feet per second divided by 440 inverse seconds. Okay. So um, this is another way. So this is another way of saying 116 feet inverse seconds over. 440 inverse seconds. So the, the seconds will cancel out because they're the same term, right? So they're going to cancel out. And we get here our final answer as 2.54 feet. Okay. So you may be wondering, okay, it's 2.54 feet, but why can't we see it? Um, and so the thing is, um, when things act like a wave, um, they really don't have any, you know, like, um, I guess the best way to see this is we can't actually perceive this wave, and, uh, it's because waves, they don't tend to have any, like, concrete form, you know, like, we see waves through water because um, it's actually affecting the surface of the water, distorting the shape. But um, we can't see air waves because we can't actually see air particles or air. So um, they're colorless, right? So they're not very visible to the naked eye. So that's one reason we can't actually see these waves. But, you know, um, if you ever think about like wind waves or sound waves um you can actually um you can actually perceive them you know with obviously your ears but um it's really hard to actually so waves don't actually have like a concrete body or physical state that we can actually um perceive so that's why waves are t they tend to be like this invisible thing that we consider Based on um, based on what we perceive, right? We 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 kind of verify their existence by the effect they produce, and not directly confirming that oh, okay, there's an actual something there causing this sound, right? Um, it's due to the tra it's due to these waves just moving through space, oscillating and transferring energy that gets perceived as um, sound waves okay all right so that's um so that's um all about waves calculating frequency speed and wavelength um so in the next video we'll start talking about electromagnetic radiation all right so i'll see everyone in the next one